following program is exclusively produced and distributed by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc., all rights reserved. Hi, Golden Age film fanatics, and welcome to DVD Classics Corner on the Air. My name is Dick Dinman, and our goal is to become your exclusive guide to the very best of the Golden Age classics coming out on DVD. We'll have reviews, breaking news of upcoming releases, plenty of surprise guests, and a special feature devoted to the great Golden Age film composers, which we call Cine Music. So let's turn on the marquee and lights, camera, action. It's time for Dick's Picks, in which I get to shine the spotlight on one of my Dick's Picks of the Week. Kino Lorber has delivered the scathing and sensuous film version of Harold Robbins' bestseller about Hollywood in the 30s, entitled The Carpetbaggers, in a stunning brand new high-def master from a 4K scan of the original 35 millimeter camera negative. And let me tell you, it looks absolutely fantastic. George Peppard plays the leading role of the ruthless tycoon Jonas Cord, but I must admit that I feel that it's the grand supporting cast that makes every torrid moment leap off the screen. Carol Baker, Bob Cummings, Lou Ayers, and Martin Balsam are all sensational. But as far as I'm concerned, it is the great Alan Ladd as Nevada Smith in his final role who delivers the heart and soul of this amazingly popular film. The Carpetbaggers Blu-ray is a Technicolor home run, and it is now available from our friends at Kino Lorber, even as we speak. Stay tuned for more Dick's Picks. Coming up on DVD Classics Corner on the Air, very soon. And it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the show journalist, columnist, film historian, and DVD and Blu-ray radio and television commentator, David DelVal. Well, David DelVal, welcome back to DVD Classics Corner on the Air on a very special occasion. Kino Lorber's release of The Carpetbaggers. And first, before I do anything else, I want to commend you on your superb commentary on The Carpetbaggers' Blu-ray. And I agree with you on virtually everything you've said, except one thing. And we, uh, I'm going to start by, by uh, telling you what I truly disagree with. On your uh, uh, wonderful commentary, you praise George Peppard, who plays uh, Jonas Cord, or as Mad Magazine said, Jonas Crud, <laughs> and you uh, praise his performance to the skies. It's about the only thing you've said that I disagree with, and I'll tell you why. As far as I'm concerned, George Peppard Hard's performance consists of one unblinking, intense glare. The same thing he used, the same device he used in the Blue Max and all of those universal flops that, uh, that he did. I know Papard was capable of more, but in this particular instance, I'm sorry, after an hour of that intense glare, I began watching everybody else, and everybody else is marvelous, and, and we'll get to that. But 
I, now I give you a chance to defend George Papard's performance. The floor well, is first yours. Of all, first of all, Dick, uh, I had a, a, a partner on that commentary, the, the cult director, David Dakota. Uh, so I didn't just sail through it by myself. But secondly, my recollection of all this, because of Carol Baker's memoirs and the fact that I knew her in Palm Springs and we talked about this movie, it was my feeling that George Picard wasn't acting. He is Jonas Cord. <laughs> and Carol Baker in... No, there, I, ne I never praised his perform uh, performance as, as an acting performance at all. Oh. He's like Babel the Ghosty and Dracula. He just <laughs> is. He just is Jonas Cord. And, he, and, he's a, and he's a total dick. And Carol Baker said the first day on the set with this man, he walked over to her and said, look, it, we're going to make it now or maybe later. And by the way, if you decide not to make it with me, I'm going to make it with Elizabeth Ashley. And I'm going to make it with, and you know what, with all that bravado and, 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 and just testosterone-driven nuttiness, he did sleep with all these people. Everyone, and, and in fact, there's even a rumor that he slept with Rock Hudson when they made Toe Brook together. Yeah. At least if you read Darwin Porter, which I do, you know, lasciviously. Yeah. But, you know, so I don't disagree with you about the part. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm simply saying that he is, he fits like a glove. And, and, you know, everyone else is acting around him. And, and even Carol Baker said, she said, it worked for our performance. But she said, I couldn't stand him when we made that movie. Yeah. Then she said, years later, he got more mellow, which, of course, I brought in my one George Papard story, which was he and I got our haircuts at the same place here in Beverly Hills years ago. But what was bizarre was that George had a toupee by then. So he would go in with the barber and act like he was getting his haircut. And then he would open the, the, they would wheel the, they would, you know, pushed the curtain back, and he had that silver, you know, kind of Ray Milan. I knew I should have been tipped off. It had a kind of Ray Milan vibe with it, you yeah, know. Yeah. But anyway, he was very nice. He was doing the A-team at that point, I guess, and he was very nice. But well, according to everybody that knew him during the time of the Carpetbaggers, he was an absolute terror. To well, let me, let me just interject here and tell you that I cast... George Peppard in his last two um, M.O.W. Uh, roles in City of Angels and Trouble in the City of Angels. And um, he lived down to my expectations because <laughs> not only was he rude to everyone, he tried to get everyone except me for some reason fired. Um, it was not a pleasant experience, but in, just in his defense, there is one performance of George Peppard where I think he reaches his full potential, and you may be surprised, I think it's in a film called Home from the Hill. I knew you were going to say that. Oh, you did? Well, oh yeah, he, uh, so Vince, that's a that's a great movie. It's a great movie, uh, uh, and uh, he's very lucky to be in it. With all, and who directed that? I, Vincent I, I Minnelli. Oh my God! Well, there you are. And you Vincent know, like Minnelli. Yeah, and yeah. Vin Minnelli was capable of great things. Well, we know this. Before. Well, yeah, but Vincent Minnelli had to fight Papard all the way through the, uh, the filming. Eleanor Parker told me this, and. Uh, Nevertheless, it's the only performance I've seen of his where there's definite warmth and vulnerability. So he was capable of it, but chose not to display it. Well, you know, he got comfortable with that semi-Jonas Cord thing because Kino Lober put out another one of his movies called PJ, oh, yeah. which has an outrageous gay bar sequence in it that yeah. has to be seen to not be believed, and Raymond Burr. Yeah. So, of yeah. course, I had to get it. <laughs> and, and honestly, honestly, George Papard in that is just a variation on Jonas Cord. Yeah. He always is. He always is. With the Even in Breakfast at Tiffany's a little. I agree. Idea. Totally. I totally agree. But let's, let's move on from Mr. Papard for now.
And I have to agree with you about what I consider the most surprising, terrific performance in the film. And I don't know who cast the movie, but it was an inspiration. And you know what I'm going to say. It's Bob Cummings. He is remarkable in, in this really despicable role. Um, yes. And there was nothing in his past to indicate that he could play this type of role. And he was so effective that about a year or two later, Gordon Douglas cast him in a similar role in the, in the awful remake of Stagecoach. And he was terrific in that. I mean, who would have thought that Bob Cummings, you know, the nice guy, uh, a terrifically handsome uh, young man, uh, great in comedy, uh, would be so effective in the role? Remarkable. Well, I think sometimes, sometimes, sometimes comedic actors or actors that are really good at comedic roles make fabulous villains. Right. Right. And, and, and casting, well, the classic example of an actor going against type is Henry Fonda in Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. Turning yeah. In, I mean, he shoots the kid. Yeah. So all of a sudden, his career takes a totally different aspect. But, no, Bob Cummings is terrific in that. And uh, I knew him slightly and ran into him of all things, the screening of Death Takes a Holiday with Evelyn Venable. And he was a charming guy, worked with Hitchcock. You know, as you, he's in a weird movie called The Lost Moment, the only oh, movie yeah. directed Susan, by Su Martin Gable. Susan Hayward. And Agnes Moorhead, yeah. aged to be 100 years old. It's, a ri it's the Aspen Papers, yeah. which, of course, was remade not long yeah. ago. Yeah. But, no, Bob Cummings, you know, everyone, Martin Balsam, of course, owns being a studio mogul who has a peptic ulcer. I think he's very... Martin Balsam is hilarious in the role. He, really he has a scene with uh, um, a young actor, I don't know the young actor's name, who happens... I think he plays his son or, or a close relative or something. Oh, right. And right. Balsam is hysterical in it. He, he's absolutely marvelous. And I'll tell you, Lou Ayers does not know how to deliver a less than compelling performance. Lou Ayers is the voice of reason in, in this crazy movie, and he's wonderful. And, and, and Carol Baker, she's, oh, well. she's wonderful. She's more than up to the sometimes ludicrous demands of her part. <laughs> but I have to tell you, uh, as good as she is, and I don't know whether you will agree with me or whether she would agree with me. I think that this role hurt her career because up to the carpetbaggers, she was considered a very top drawer, serious uh, uh, actress. And I think somehow with the awful Harlow, and the lackluster Sylvia uh, about two or three years later. Uh, and other than playing a prim Quaker in Chi uh, John Ford's Cheyenne, Cheyenne Autumn, uh, she then was kind of stuck with European softcore trash, and directors well, just stopped taking her seriously. And this is a talented, talented actress. Well, she would agree. As a matter of fact, there's no, there's no question. She's written about it. It's obvious. Her Italian uh, output is based on it, and it's just one man, yeah. Joseph E. Levine. Yeah. Joseph E. Levine put Carol Baker under contract at a time when she wanted to buy a house in L.A. She wanted to. She needed money, so he offered her. An absolutely, you know, like Don Corleone, uh, you could not refuse this <laughs> offer. Yeah. So she has always, well, re she regretted Harlow far more than she regretted the Carpetbaggers. Oh, yeah. Because the Carpetbaggers, as we all know, the reason I asked to do the Carpetbaggers was because when I saw that as a kid, because I saw it when it was new, so I was like 
12 years old or something. Me too. Uh, I didn't, you know, it went over my head a lot of it. But when that sequence comes in with Carol Baker not knowing that her husband's dead and trying to get George Papard out of her bedroom and him knowing that he's going to do whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like 11 or 12 years old, and <laughs> I'm thinking, this is, this is very serious stuff. And this guy is dangerous. You know, I mean, I didn't. It was, I was very smitten with the whole idea. Yeah. It was very, it was very entertaining. Yeah. Dick, that's the key to it. But no, Carol Baker told me that even her Italian movies, and there's one of them which has just come out in a box set called it's got several titles. The sky is falling. It's basically her playing Carol Baker in exile with the swimming pool, the white telephone the same Harlow outfit with the boa, the boa nightgown that Jean Harlow wore in Dinner at Eight. But she's, you know, alcoholic, and her, her friends are all, like, crazy, and, and she's waiting for Joe Levine to call her. Yeah. That's the joke in the movie. Uh. And the white phone goes into the swimming pool, and she drowns or yeah. something. I shouldn't give it away, but who's going to... You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, you mentioned Sylvia a minute ago, Dick. Yeah. No one has seen Sylvia. This is not out on Blu-ray. No, I don't think I don't. I haven't seen. I saw it once, and I barely remember it. Yeah, I but saw. It's I, not available. I saw it on uh, Hollywood Boulevard, and it was a totally unremarkable, uh, inoffensive, but totally unremarkable uh, film. Uh, I remember uh, thinking, "Oh my God, I haven't seen Joanne Drew for a long time," and Joanne <laughs> Drew. Well, had a role in that, that one of her last roles. Well, but, I kept hearing it had it had adult themes. Yeah. By the way, the other thing I agree with you. Oh, for me, the most irritating actress, at, at least in this film, and no, in Ship of Fools too. Yeah. No. <laughs> I just find Elizabeth Ashley. Oh my God! I had to grit my teeth. Every time she showed up on screen in the carpet baggers, my God! <laughs> she, Didn't I say that in the commentary? <laughs> yes, you did. I, I agree totally. <laughs> I know I did, and I took a risk with that. But honestly, Dick, I felt completely the same way, and I know David did too. Because, but he was a little nicer about her than I was, because I just <laughs> said she wants. She is the whiny bitch. <laughs> that you just don't want to just go away. And I actually said at one point on, on the commentary, she comes in and is annoying him when he's trying to build like the Howard Hughes aspect of it. Yeah. And I just said, go away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and then, of course, the fact that she can re reforms him is that's Hollywood. That's not Harold yeah. Robbins. No, no. And I want to bring up uh, the, uh, an uh, actor in a supporting role, in a very supporting role, uh, who I think had a, a, a kind of a sad career. I'm talking about Arthur Franz. Now he was, Arthur Franz had the leading role in Edward Dimitrix, excellent, the sniper. And then he was relegated to cheap sci-fi junk. And only, Monster on the yeah, yeah. yeah. And only Dimitrik would break France's downward spiral by casting Fr uh, France in featured parts in big-budget films like The Cane Mutiny and The Carpetbaggers. And I think it's a pity, because he's, he's a very, very good actor and should have had, should have had a bigger career. Oh, well, but, speaking of bigger careers, do you remember the actor, I don't think he did much after that, that played the partner of Jonas Cord in oh, the sure, carpet bag? Oh, sure, sure, Ralph Tager. Ralph Tager. But talk a little about him, because I thought he was kind of interesting in that, and then you don't see him in much film-wise after that. Well, the, uh, supposedly there were uh, some behavior problems with him. He did do a series called Hondo, based upon the John Wayne right. movie. And then he he vanished, and I think he uh, opened a, <laughs> believe it or not, a dry cleaner <laughs> business in oh, no. in Bakersfield or somewhere. Oh, oh how well that And uh, yeah, I still haven't gotten back my shirts. So, oh, uh, well, you shouldn't have sent them, is <laughs> my comment to you. The other, uh, the, well, the last... I, 
the, the last. I knew you would know. I knew you would know. Well, the last thing, uh, the last uh, individual I want to recommend before we go to the heart and what I consider the heart and soul of the film. Absolutely. And we'll we'll get there, uh, and that is the score by Elmer Bernstein, which is magnificent. It's very similar to the score that Bernstein did for The Caretakers, the Joan Crawford film. But, uh, I mean, when, when that film opens with that driving, jazzy score of uh, Elmer Bernstein, you know you're in for a great ride. Well, even as a kid. See, that now you're hitting on why I enjoyed it so much. One of the things that made it so enjoyable when you're 12 years old and looking at this with adult themes is the fact that that, that, that score elevates the movie. And Without it, it's like chariots of fire. Yeah. You take the score away and it's not going to be as good. Right. Uh, and no, that's one of, and you know, that movie, I just think it's one of the most, it's one of the few of the ones that I, that I would go back to and watch again. You know, yeah. it's one of those movies, if it comes on, you're going to watch it. Yeah. You're not going to take it. I would, want to, would love to say that about The Adventurers, but it's three hours long. <laughs> I so. know. I know. But I, I, I think I'd love to tag did Stiletto, and I did this. So maybe I'm on the Harold Robbins camp. Yeah, Who knows? yeah. Well, we're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about the gentleman, I think we both agree, who is the heart and soul of the carpetbaggers. And we'll be back right after this. We pause now for station identification. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is exclusively produced and released by Dick Denman's Double D Productions, Inc. All rights reserved. We're back with David DelVal and David, of course... I'm talking about the great Alan Ladd. Alan Ladd, yeah. Who plays Nevada Smith in the film. And I will have to say this. Alan Ladd, as a, when I was a child and went to see Shane, Alan Ladd became an icon to me. One of the, the finest film actors. An actor who... who knew how to use stillness so effectively and and get yet get the point across. Now during the filming of this and you go over in your commentary what terrible shape Alan Ladd was in when he was yes. uh, doing it. Um, the strange thing is, and I don't know whether you remember this, during the early publicity for the film Joseph E. Levine said in print that after the carpetbaggers, we're going to do a prequel called Nevada Smith, and Alan Ladd is going to be our star. And, of course, you look at the eventual release of Nevada Smith with Steve McQueen, and you realize there's absolutely no way Ladd could have done a minute of it. it well, there's no way Steve McQueen could do it either because in the, in the novel, he's 16 or 17 years old. Both, both the men that were asked to play Nevada Smith were way too old. Way yeah, too old. Yeah. And even though people build an argument for McQueen's charisma and everything, oh, yeah. of, the two, of the two movies, The Carpetbaggers is, is the more believable of, and especially to create the myth of Nevada Smith. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's just, if you don't know that coming in, it's an enjoyable movie, I'm sure. It yeah. is. It is. But uh, I have to say that at watching Alan Ladd 
became so painful for me. I fought like a, like a little dog. I followed his releases around, and as the releases, as his films got lower and lower in quality, they began to surface as second features in grind houses. And I went because anything he did, uh, I, would, I would go to see. But if you, have, if you have ever seen, David, Man in the Net, 13 West Street, and especially One Foot in Hell, you would be shocked at how far down uh, a lad fell. Well, it's and, like Errol Flynn. Oh, it's much worse than Errol Flynn. I mean, Flynn could function somewhat, and Flynn, you know, even though he was old and wrinkly and <laughs> bloated, still was a very handsome man, I think. Uh, yes, well, yeah. you know, he held it together, he, but, you know, uh, Alan Ladd's wife was his agent, which I was know. a horrendous mistake. Sue Carroll. And she's probably the architect of his doom, in a way. Well, yes, uh, but you have to realize she was the architect of his stardom. She was well, responsible. There you, are, you see? Yeah. But, but, but see, time changed, yeah. and she didn't change with them. You're right. And the biggest mistake, to my mind, that, that she ever made was uh, getting Alan Ladd out of Giant. Uh, because George Stevens was so impressed with Ladd in uh, Shane that he wanted to use... Uh, a lad in, in Giant, in the, <laughs> the James... Oh, Dean. that would have been one. Well, you know, it's like, it's like Judy Garland in Valley of the Dolls. They should have put up with whatever she put out right. and kept her in that movie. Right. She should never have been taken out of it. And uh, I love Susan Hayward, but you and I know what, what I'm saying here. Yeah. With, oh, with yeah. Judy Garland in that movie, it would have been an entirely different thing. That's, that's true. And I had Don Murray on my show, who was a co-star of Alan Ladd in One Foot in Hell, and he told me that he too, when he was a kid saw, or, or, or a young man, saw Shane and was so impressed with Ladd, couldn't wait to work with him, and he said it was impossible. He said he was doing one scene where the camera tracked both he and, and Ladd down a western street as they were talking. And as the scene progressed and, D and Don Murray was saying his lines, he turned around and Ladd wasn't there. He had fallen down drunk in the street. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, it's painful. And I will never... You mentioned the fact that uh, everybody uh, on the carpet baggers was very kind to Alan Ladd and helpful except to George him. Papard. Except George Pappard. I will never forgive Isn't George Pappard for that. I will never no. forgive him for that. No. Carol yeah. Baker writes about that, too. She said it was heartbreaking because of all the things that w they put in that script yeah. with this knockdown, drag-out fight. With, with, and, you know, Pappard was a young man in that, you know, and, and oh my God, you yeah. can see it. That's the real tension in that movie. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, that nearly breaks the fourth wall. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, it's uncomfortable. But, you know, when you're little, I didn't know any of this, nor did you when we first saw it. Yeah. And then yeah. Now we know a great deal more about it. And I certainly know a great deal more about, you know, what we what is called trash classic, you know, whether it's Jacqueline Suzanne or yeah. Harold Robbins yeah. or, or, or D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, right. you know, uh, done, done well, these things stand up to the test of time. Exactly, exactly. And well, they, I love the carpet baggers. Oh, you know, I do too. I mean, it's, <laughs> for what it is, <laughs> it is great, and I have to say, and I, uh, I can say this for the, uh, uh, the prequel, Nevada Smith, Tina Lorber has released both The Carpetbaggers and Nevada Smith in two separate editions, and they both look superb. They are spectacular. Yeah. Great transfers, uh, uh, 
wonderful to look at and wonderful to listen to. And uh, obviously both uh, David and uh, yours truly r recommend The Carpetbaggers as well as Nevada Smith as two great releases which, uh, which I think fans will, will relish time and time again. And we're running out of time, David, but I do yeah. want to ask you what's new in, in your life. And keep it clean, please. <laughs> Well, I'll keep it professional. That's even cleaner. Uh, uh, well, as for, for Kino Lober, I've got a number of titles in the work. Um, I don't think it's, it's I'm saying anything out of school to say that I just completed Alaska Seas with uh, the wonderful Robert Ryan and uh, the, the great Jan Sterling, uh -huh. uh, which for me was, you know, I love being excited to movies that I would never have probably been exposed to otherwise, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I did that with my friend uh, uh, Stan Schaefer, who I, I've done a few with. Stan's working on a pre-code book. And I did Bluebeard with Richard Burton for uh, Umbrella, the Australian company. And, uh, you know, that, that's Edward Dimitrick, too, by the way. David, as usual, you are wonderful as a guest and I always so look forward to having you on the show and I hope you'll consent in the future to do many many more with me because uh, my play I look forward to doing them with you Dick Dimmons. Well, that's my show for today. DVD Classics Corner on the Air is conceived, written, produced, and directed by me, Double D. And if you'd like to hear some of my older, vintage shows, please go to www.dvdclassicscorner.net, where in addition to the broadcasts, you'll find hundreds of my print reviews of classic DVD releases. So, until next week... Keep well, keep happy, and... Keep listening.